Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. So today we'll be looking at tibial fractures. So just to give a brief overview of why tibial fractures are important, um, the reason why we're looking at tibial fractures is because they're relatively common. So out of all the long bone fractures, it's actually the most common one out of all of them. Um, and it can affect different areas of the tibia, uh, including the leg and the ankle. In terms of the causes of tibial fractures as well, um, they, be, they can be classified into two different mechanisms. So generally in younger patients, you would see high energy mechanisms like car crashes um, and athletic incidences. Whereas in older patients, it might be less energy uh, falls contributing to the tibial fracture. And in terms of treatment, there are two different pathways. It can be either conservative management or with surgery. Um, and with regards to the complications of tibial fractures as well, it's good to just keep an eye out on certain things like the development of emboli or DVT, as well as compartment syndrome, infection, and um, arthritis as well uh, as a result of the fracture. So just going back to the common causes of tibial fractures, um, so when we're looking at the younger patient population, uh, the, the causes of them are generally from high energy, high velocity impacts. So that's things like car crashes, falls from height and athletic incidences. Um, and so because of this high energy impact, it's more likely to cause fragmentation and involvement of the adjacent fibula as well. So it's just to keep a good eye out um, for adjacent structures that could be damaged too. And given that there's a higher energy impact to these incidences as well, um, it can also lead to the damage of surrounding soft tissue injury and uh, as well as the neurovasculature around the, um, the leg as well, leading to things like compartment syndrome. Uh, with regards to older people, so they're generally from falls, uh, either from standing or from twisting. And so because of that, they're a lower energy mechanism um, there can be underlying risks uh, for people who might be more predisposed to tibial fractures, including osteoporosis, knee arthritis uh, because of that reduced range of motion, and also other gait abnormalities, whether that's a cognitive cause or other issues of, with cognitive decline as well. And because of that lower impact, we're obviously going to see less severe soft tissue injury associated with it too. So with regards to the workup of a patient who's coming in with a suspected fracture, generally we're looking at it from the history and examination perspective. So when we're looking at the presenting symptoms, we're identifying to see whether they have any uh, acute leg pain and then trying to ascertain the um, specific mechanism of the leg pain as well. So whether that's you know the high velocity incident or a fall, they're the more general uh, common causes of the leg pain and tibial fracture. And then from that, we're looking at the pain grading and then to see if there's any leg deformity as well. Uh, and then after that, we're assessing function too. So how much can they weight bear? And what was their function before the incident versus after the incident, just to determine the, the impact that it has having on the patient. And then uh, with many fractures as well, we're wanting to assess the different complications uh, especially the acute complications of fracture, whether that's neurovascular uh, compromise and compartment syndrome, or um, the possibility of infection from an open or closed fracture as well. And then looking at the risk factors that might have contributed towards this to prevent it in the future as well, whether that's underlying medical conditions or some medications like steroids that can cause um, osteoporosis too. And then when we're looking at the examination of a patient, we're breaking it down into look, feel, move, special tests and assessment of neurovascular as well. So when we're looking at the leg that's um, you know, acutely deformed, we're looking at any angulation or open wounds. And then we're feeling the leg as well, to, especially with the firmness of the soft tissue around it for any compartment syndrome. And then we're moving the leg to feel for any bony crepitus, um, as well as for um, any you know, pain and deformity on movement, but we want to be relatively conservative with movement on fractures, as we know. Um, and when we're looking at special tests, we're trying to test for any ligamentous or uh, meniscal injuries with the McMurray's, Lockman, uh, Lockman's, and the other LCL, MCL testing as well. So 
Lastly, with the neurovascular, it's about looking to see if they've got sensation to the legs, as well as that if they have uh, peripheral vascular supply to the distal foot as well. Uh, again, just for that compartment syndrome. Okay, so moving on from history exam, we're looking at investigations. So as a first line mainstay of investigation, it would be x-rays, but we would consider um, ultrasound mostly just to uh, assess for that neurovascular compromise. So we're using the ultrasound, especially that Doppler component to look for the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial pulse to see if that's been affected in the injury. And then when we're looking at the x-rays, um, we're taking two x-rays, the AP and lateral, as well as looking at the unaffected leg as well to compare the differences between the two. Um, and with all fractures as well, we want to repeat the x-ray after we've splinted or surgically managed the fracture as well. Um, with regards to other modalities like CT and MRI, they're generally reserved for the more complex injuries. So for a CT, uh, we're looking, we would be using that in instances where there's involvement of the joint, the joint plateau, or the posterior malleolus, so areas surrounding the joints that have a higher complexity of injury. And with MRI, because it's better at looking at soft tissue, we'd be using that to look for meniscal and ligamentous injuries as well. Okay, so with regards to the classification of how we're looking at a tibial fracture, it's essentially just based on the anatomical location. So it can be divided into the proximal aspect of the tibia, the shaft or the distal or malleoli region. And so with the proximal region, it can be commonly from the plateau, the intercondylar notch or the uh, tubercle as well. Um, so it's just these three different regions of the proximal leg as well as further down on the shaft and the distal malleoli. Okay, so when we're looking at the x-rays, um, just giving you an example of these three different regions. Uh, with this first one here, it is involving the um, tibial plateau. And so because this is a pediatric case, we're considering the Salter Harris fracture. And in this instance, because it's going through the tibial plateau and the growth plate, it would be a type four. And because of that, it's um, affecting our management because of the paediatric case. Um, with the tibial shaft injury, uh, generally they're from more high impact traumas that can affect both the tibia and the fibula. And lower down, we have the distal malleoli. And in these instances, we have to be quite careful as well because other structures like the fibula can also be injured uh, with these injuries too. So like I said before, we're also assessing for the complications of tibial fractures. So the more common uh, complications that we see uh, uh, includes infection. So that's particularly relevant for open fractures. Um, and surprisingly, actually one in four tibial fractures are open fractures. So that's probably given the uh, velocity and the high impact of um, a lot of these fractures. And so because of that, we want to um, assess for any infection and start antibiotic prophylaxis as well, if we're suspecting that too. Um, obviously with fractures, there's pain associated with it. So we wanna try and help manage that pain, especially after we treat the underlying uh, fracture too. And I've talked about compartment syndrome a couple of times, but one of the key things to look out for when we're clinically assessing compartment syndrome are the five Ps. So when a patient comes in with disproportionate pain in the leg, paresthesia, pallor, pressure, and paralysis, uh, which is generally seen in the later stages of compartment syndrome, that's when we start to get concerned about it. And just as a additional addit to uh, compartment syndrome, generally features like pulselessness is seen in acute limb ischemia, but not necessarily seen in compartment syndrome. So, other complications include DVTs um, because the patient might not be mobilizing as quickly and fat tissue embolism from um, the fracture leading to the release of um, bone marrow into the blood. So uh, otherwise there's um, soft tissue injuries, uh, non-union as well from the bones and that's classified as non-healing of the bones after nine months. And also as a long-term picture as well, we can see things like calf atrophy, as well as functional limitations in patients, in particular younger patients when there are 
higher impact uh, and there's a greater impact on their quality of life as well. Um, with involvement of the joint, there's also a risk of arthritis as well, in particular with tibial plateaus fractured. So finally, we're moving on to treatment. So when we're seeing in an acute presentation of a suspected fracture, we're following the classic rest, ice, compression and elevation. And then we're splinting to immobilize the fracture and providing some analgesia as well. Um, subsequently, we can follow up with uh, fracture management by going down two different pathways. One is the non-operative pathway, so either a closed reduction or a cast and then followed by a cast immobilization. And so that's generally put for cases where um, there's not too much of an impact on the tibia, so it doesn't need uh, surgery. And so for instances, when we're considering surgery, it would be cases like an open fracture. And so because of that infection risk, we want to irrigate and debride and then start antibiotics as soon as we can. Um, and then subsequently, there are other um, mechanisms of operative treatment as well, including external fixation. So that's when we have the metallic device on the outside of the leg or internal fixation where it's um, drilled into the internal aspect of the leg. So it's not seen on the outside. And in more extreme cases as well, there are amputations, but that's obviously not very commonly done. Um, and then after the treatment, we want to follow up with x-ray just to make sure everything's aligned and looking nice. And then physiotherapy as well to allow for that um, improvement in the range of motion for patients too. Great. Thanks so much, everyone.